Okay, I'm going to drop a water and I'll grab a menu for you. Do you want anything to drink to start? I'll be back in a moment. You don't need to use the keyboard because you have the clicker. That's true now. There's another product that's evolved in the last, since 20, 25 or so. For 20 hours, somebody told me the other night, it's the 20 hours we refer yes, to. When we talk about that decade. Uh, not your mom's marketplace anymore. And as I alluded to, the old schemes were limited supply, you got to grab this thing now. That... Uh, there was no credit that you had to buy it, cash that, at least in my parents' time, cash and carry, take it now, sounds a little like Maxwell Street. There were chokeholds I, I observe when I think about past ways of buying and selling, and those were waitresses, and you got to see the clerk, remember, and you got to get it out of the showcase, and the uh, clerk would have keys, and uh, sales reps you had to see before you buy the car. Now you can buy the whole car, you can order the thing up from your living room on, on the web. But there were chokeholds, I call it, or purchase points that were in some ways impeding the sale, but in others uh, guaranteed that there was more control from the organization uh, over the consumer. Now we talk about transparency. And we talk about buy it yourself, order it yourself, how many colors do you want it? Uh, Self-service, e-shopping, e e-commerce. Are we better off for that? And I have some some doubts and questions about it, especially the transparency, <coughs> the idea that you can do it all yourself, self-service. And I was thinking about this when I jammed up on the Yahoo the other day and couldn't get the thing to work for one reason or another. And I thought, uh, how do I call Yahoo? 
Uh, how do I contact a person at Gmail to help me out of this jam? And to my surprise, I, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't find a toll-free number anywhere, and I could barely find a an e, e address to get me into customer service. Have you tried that? Have you tried to wait? Wiggle out of the web problem? Possible. Maybe you had better luck than I did. And yet, you know, I, I started looking around my own house for how do I get out of a jam with uh, uh, a particular appliance? And I found that if I turned it over somewhere on the machine or in a manual, was a, a toll free number. Then I started looking more around the house, finding things. I didn't even need to know anything about it. And there's all sorts of help labels. I was looking at this common can of tomatoes. We welcome your questions and comments. And then there was 800 tomato or something on there. <laughs> I thought, well, that's handy and that's helpful. I started looking around the bathroom. And it says, contact us, say habla espanol, with a great toll-free number that I might want to call in the middle of the night. Got my finger stuck in a shampoo or something. I, there was just no end to the help they were extending to me. Here's Skippy. Skippy on the shelf said something about uh, send your comments and see I had one. Oh, 1-800-S-Skippy. Dial it. You can remember while you're eating your sandwich that one. But I thought, I don't need help getting the peanut butter out of the jar. I need help with Hotmail or Gmail. And I had a hell of a time getting any help. And I think they're happy with that because they sure don't want what labor costs. They want the thing to sell and maintain itself. Pretty much. So that... Their original idea is all the sweat equity they seem to have in the situation. Very little service on the website that we all buy, we all purchase, we all subscribe to. That's just one small way I think that this new era of e-shopping frustrates us and takes away from some of the conveniences they brag about uh, with the website itself being the biggest headache. So are we better off? Well, some of us will be able to point to how we are, but can we cut the front lights, or is that a one size fits all? No, no, can I put it down? We'll put it down. No, no. Can we move? They still make Rio stats for tearing down. I think I have one of these to turn the lights down, and then the batteries up. We're already asking, Mary. Can we? Yeah, right, she'll, she'll have them off in a little bit. By the way, am I supposed to stop at a certain time? No. no. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. The more you say for her. Uh, I won't take that long, I promise you. Uh, unless you're going to church. Thanks. Um, I, I'm starting to look around, too, and seeing the demise of many... Remember Goldblatt's and Weebolt's, and of course those are gone, but even Sears is in trouble, and Marshall Fields, of course, suffered, and Carson's is struggling. I'm seeing now more dollar stores and uh, resale shops than new construction for department stores. I'm seeing more of these thrift stores pop up in larger dimensions than I can remember uh, new construction or groundbreaking for department stores. With uh, all sorts of larger larger parking lots, yeah, that they even had one 10 years ago was the surprise. With parking lots, with sales going on, with expanded hours, I can go in on Sundays to these retail shops. And after all, these are recycled goods and I think uh, more merit in, in them than consuming all kinds of new stuff with bubble packs and wrapping around it. And I'll talk about this long tail concept that Tim Bolger told me about a couple nights ago here at the college. 
and how products now can be cycled and recycled for new uses, and that's called by some economists the long tail on the product cycle. So good for dollar stores and good for us, bottom line. Um, I see places like Family Dollar in a commercial sense, with things wrapped up, taking more corners. And if you watch corners, corners are very vital as commercial sites, the most expensive and probably the toughest thing to preserve in Chicago. The corners are golden and four corners are very rare to see anything more than 50 years old on our corners. Um, most, what, what's taken them? What's taken the four corners now? We often get, we often get a, uh, we'll get a Starbucks gently wedged in, sometimes they're discreet about taking Victorian structures and just sort of cladding on it with their green sign. But we'll usually see a gas station take the whole corner and largely 70% for asphalt. It's a horrible, horrible use of the, of the corner that used to be a place where you'd, you'd meet and greet and maybe buy a newspaper or a soda. Uh, I suppose you can't stop that kind of thing, but I'm seeing banks take the corners too just for an ATM. And most of the ground, 60% of it being asphalt. So it's a hell of an unsightly situation that's going on on four corners, and usually two of them are, as you said, a CVS or a, maybe a Starbucks judiciously put in there. Um, so much for the flip-flop of the old retail patterns, and I'm in most favor of the first bullet, uh, I mean the second bullet, uh, the salvation I mean in the thrift stores than some of the uh, commercial uh, abuse of the uh, four Sorry, corners. You get here 20 minutes or so. Something else we saw, oh, 20 years ago I would say, was the onslaught of the regional mall that I thought would just not stop putting so many mom pa stores out of business. And you know the culprits, the Yorktown and the uh, Oak Brook Center and the uh, on the north side, the uh, Old Orchard, we got the southwest side, we got uh, things like Fort City. There was a big worry about that, putting small stores out of business if you couldn't buy retail space in the mall or lease ground space in the malls that you would be out of business. Something came along that surprised me around the turn of the 90s, and that was this strip mall idea. Now, you see it almost every two blocks in Chicago, there's a strip mall. A little more care is going into the facade improvements, and you'll see some thematics to it, and brick or some touches that allude to what was there. But it's got to have parking to the door, right? got to have parking. Um, sure, the, the regionals were in a sea of, of traffic and parking, but even the regionals have woken up to the idea of greening it a, a bit and, and some sort of uh, tree or landscaping they've tried to put in these regional seas of parking. Not so much Riverside, but I noticed Yorktown's made itself over in Old Orchard. But with the uh, strip mall, I don't know if we're in net and a net gain or net loss with the strip malls, we can't walk to them after all. If you're a senior, if you're a, a walker, if you're a biker, it's a little easier to get into the strip mall. Um, I'd like to think um, that small businesses can more easily lease in those strip malls, but I'm, I'm not sure. I do see, but what do we typically see in the strips now? Chinese restaurants. A Chinese, you know, uh, uh, happy box or whatever. Uh, let's see you look, see your food. Payday loans? Payday loans. Okay, a small version of the Big Bang. Cigarette stores? Uh, the retail, yeah, the wholesale. Wholesale. The is replace the old cigar shop. And what one? 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven or... What's the other one? White Hen? Are they gone? They're out White of White Hen was bought by 7-Eleven. Yeah. They got so, bought out by 7-Eleven. 
Then 11 and I thought was on the ropes. White hen was coming on strong, then white hen pantry closed, and then 7 11 back beat. Payday long. Yeah, they, they consolidated long. about three years ago. A couple of people said payday long. <laughs> I'm giving them. And they are awful. Uh, Duncan, Duncan's come in big. It's rare to see one without a strip mall without. Uh, H and R seasonal. A basket for snack. Quick on the go food. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some hope for the small guy, like the Chinese restaurant, and a dry cleaner here and there. And you won't see a dry cleaner or too many Chinese mom shops in the regional mall. So let's hear three cheers for them that they've been able to get into the strip mall. But more and more and more, I see a, a Duncan or a Baskin getting into those corners. Dental, I'll talk about. Hold that thought because that's one of those still one man, one woman shows, family shows. Um, the big question is can you afford the lease? And I know with the dry cleaner and the takeout Chinese, you got to have cars nearby. You got to have a couple of slots in front of the store. In fact, I think the city and villages dictate seven or eight spaces per shop have to be available to accommodate traffic or you'd have quite a jam in front of these outlets with no parking. So some of them are so car dependent and I think that little dry cleaner is. Without the slots, he'd have to go elsewhere. But it's been a trend and a change in the last 10 to 15 years and, and have given the regional, the big regional, some pause to think about their futures. <coughs> there are some as uh, Pauline alluded to that are chain resistant. Well, like the term on your label, stain resistant. Mm -hmm. Chain resistant, and I thought, who's left? What what sort of enterprise can resist the chain? And I thought about funeral homes, and I thought about dry cleaners, and tailors, and if you need a carpet or drapery, you probably can't dial up a chain. Yeah, Empire, what was that? 518, 300, Empire. That's local. 588, 300, Empire. You know, going back a long time, it's the, the limit. But, come up with exceptions to my rule, but I think Dentists have largely resisted the uh, sure. franchise. And almost all construction trades I can think of, if you need a new roof, if you need flooring, if you need tiling, you probably can't call a big chain. So the first bullet are trades that have resisted. The second, uh, can you think of one? Can you think, uh, add another, because I'm not sure. Coffee, come on, the Starbucks. Come on. There's Starbucks, there's... Um, oh, yeah, we got, <laughs> we've got syndicators all over for coffee. Salons, spas. Haircut. I put hair cutters oh. and spas have resisted, but there are some, and especially those tanning beds and... Fantastic stamps. Uh, getting, change. getting bigger. These are the quasi-independents, quasi hair cutters. So if you're an immigrant trying to get a start, you may be able to still start a corner hair cuttery. And I know there's one called hair cuttery that'll put me. Yeah. But I'm thinking of those cutters that are in malls that are chains, but there are many, many independents, probably more indies than chain. There's one across the street. We've got one here, right? Jewelers, yeah, there's 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 those chains, uh, Robinson, and you, you hear them come with the big ads at uh, Christmas time, but largely jewelers in Chicago still resist the, the chain store phenomenon. And, and many bars, yeah, I know you're going to tell me about TGIF, mm -hmm. and what are the others? Applebee's. 
That will be a hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, bring on board. Yeah. Ben again is the bar. Chili wasn't created as a bar, I don't think, but it was food with liquor. How about Hooters? Hooters. 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 <laughs> a big effort to syndicate uh, a bar. Still, I think, in Chicago, especially in Chicago, Boston. Uh, we got more uh, taverns that are unaffiliated, unchanged. We ought to move the college. Churches too. Yeah, pretty soon the college will be French. No, we have three outlets, right? We have two locations. Yeah. What did you say, Tim? We have two locations now with the college. The college has two locations. Two locations. Count them. Two locations. Dallas or Houston? Dallas. Dallas. Okay. So there's an example. Even our college. Uh, child care, Flores. I know there are FTDs. But that's just a, an appendage of most independent flower shops. So can you add more indies to my list? Because hmm? Weight Watchers is coming. Weight Watchers is coming. They're all big up cool shops. Are they, are they truly independent? Or aren't they? They depend on their marching orders from a, a headquarters somewhere. Bike shops are usually independent. Okay, like Cosey's on Maxwell Street. Repair shops Re for like TVs or computers. Old right. times. Repair shops, although the Staples and Office Max claim they can do anyone's anywhere, repair anyone's anywhere. The tough road to hope. Uh, on Lincoln Avenue, there's still a guy who repairs your old techniques, Gerard and uh, turntables by Harvin Carden. Well, he's alone. <coughs> He's alone. If you happen to have an old amp on a turntable and a diamond stylus needle, you can still find a way to replace it. He's the only, the only guy I know on the north side. He's on Lincoln Avenue. Oh, there's a guy on Matros. 20th Century TV repair. Oh my god. And he does the. I does typewriter. Oh, and the typewriter. I think that guy's out of business. Yeah. My third category are the uh, shops in the chain gang. And that means you can barely find one, barely find one, for example, that isn't A's True Value or uh, Home Depot or in the gang. No, you can throw uh, animal care places in uh, your independent mix. I put the them in mostly, the cats. mostly in the, the the vets, the vets, along with the dentists. But 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 pet smarts trying to move strongly. Yeah. I know I talked to Dr. Lichtenberg. Pet saying, graduated. From but I'm saying uh, animal care. You know, weekend boarding, uh -huh. uh, dog grooming. They're all independent. The big big one across from uh, Buddha Lounge, Funky Buddha Lounge. You drop your dog and you go to Funky Buddha for, <laughs> for drinks. Dog, dog room and it's fun. <laughs> what about hobby shops? That's not what they Yeah, do. I'm going to mention the hobby shops. They're dinosaurs. My goodness, the old hobby shops. Hobby hobby. Hobby hobby. Right. Well, I'm shops. Yeah, I'd put this in the arts, crafty, hobby shop category. The knitting and yarn that fall in. Bob, didn't your dog graduate from Tesla? He got a, he got training at PetSmart in the malls now. It's amazing to, to look at. Um, you guys on the block. Uh, Class four at the supermarket is my subtitle on that. Uh, <coughs> see from the back, I wonder if Martha can see him. Oh wow, we got some old friends in the back. Can you see back in there? All right. I can't. You can't see this thing because there's not much further to to go to push it back. But uh, class at the supermarket, uh, the Balvos and blue cheese crowd versus the bag it yourself group. <laughs> and I guess I waffle between one and another. Sometimes. My wife will go to Whole Foods. I sit and read a magazine in that case. Not some place I like to 
to go through. But when I go into all these, I know where everything is. When I go into uh, the old wholesale food, what? Uh, peach market. The, the peach market and, the, and those markets. I seem to know where everything is. It's within reach of a room this size or two. And I seem to be able to buy anything in it. Whole Foods, I have a hell of a time. Uh, Jewel as well. But um, it seems like Aldi's trying lately to upscale itself. And then, have you been in lately? You got. First thing I saw was a new sign. <laughs> because I, I, if I were emigrating here, emigrating from another country, and I passed an Aldi, I barely know what was a LDI. I think it might be a government agency or a social center. Now they're calling it Aldi Food Market. Aldi Food Market, uh, helping us identify, you know, what what it is to begin with. Then I started looking deeper and finding things like European beer, German beer. Now this stuff, and and Euro wine, and uh, artichokes. The other day, I found. So I thought there's a kind of a an entry point in business where you're the cheapest guy on the block and then you try to sort of upgrade because I remember for a time when Target was considered something like a Walmart new entry. And now you know, Walmart's race to the bottom makes Target look a lot better, doesn't it? In, in, in the look, in the feel. Um, okay. They do give a little more to charities. They yeah. seem to be uh, retailing with a human face. Uh, they have a scholarship program. I'm not sure what Walmart is giving back. It's surely taking more than they're giving back <laughs> these times. I realized that we used to laugh. I thought Hyundai. I, I didn't know how to even pronounce it. I thought, where's that going to go? Now it bought respect, isn't it? After all these years, it's very tough to introduce and market a car from scratch in this world economy and uh, Korea did it with Hyundai to where it's picked up some status to be sort of showing themselves off as Asia's uh, new Volvo, so to speak. All right. So, so then we'll have something else come after these, after Walmart that may look even shabbier, but they want a niche, they want a toll hole on the marketplace and to get that in America you often have to start at the bottom of the, uh, the uh, pecking order or the feeding trough. There. So what will we get? Uh, we'll see in the next decade as far as cheap scale retailing. But this I like. I was thinking more about, thinking more about this status issue and where did it all come from and uh, I can remember in high school where the the wealthier kids had a Lacoste. Remember that? The old yes. alligator. <laughs> right. One of the few little giveaways that I spend a little more. Brooks Brothers for a long time, since the 50s, I spend a little more. I would have a label or, I don't know what that thing is, some sort of sheep skin on a, on a weight, on a scale. The old Brooks Brothers logo. And mostly those were inside the shirt. But Lacoste was the first to start showing it on the outside. They were very small, but uh, a branding mechanism. And then there were a few, like Spalding and Wilson, and you'd see the sign on the other kid's glove, and you'd say, i got to have a Wilson, too. Uh, starting to put ideas in our heads about branding, but that was a long, long time ago. Then I saw by the 80s, I recall, Nike's coming up. What else? What else came? Yeah. You, you may remember more of that. Pumas. Pumas on the shoe. Adidas. <laughs> yeah, and the Adidas, wherever that was. Somebody bought Adidas. You forgot Izon? Well, that's Lacoste. And you forgot PF Flyers. PF Flyers. Oh. The shoes the kids wear. Yeah, you had to have the Peter Brown. Buster Brown. Yeah, Schwinn bicycles. <laughs> Yeah, and Schwinn had it all then, back in Chicago. Well, Nike and the Gap came along. 
they couldn't brand the knob. They were just, you know, practically putting it on your, your arm when you bought the thing, that you had it all over the shirt. And I thought, people are going to reject this. They're not going to want GAP on their shoulder bone. And sure enough, kids started taking to it. I see adults with it. So I had to, like, do the strip here because, you know, I just... I, I went to that thrift and I thought, I'll get this for the show, right? So, it was cool to put the name of the product on, on I don't know, is there anything on the back of this? No. Oh. And they have a storm something going on in the back, too, with Nautica. The whole Navy stuff was just cool, penetrating through the 20 O's, right? With with all that, and said, I've got a brand here. I spent some real money. I paid some real money for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One fool at a time. <laughs> One fool at a time. <laughs> He's doing some good to the label. This is clearly just making some profit and moving up scale, making a kid pay a little bit more, or, or maybe he thinks he's not with it. <coughs> now in the 20 O's, we had some really expensive wear, like that Hollister. What, what are the ones that Hollister cost these days? Hollister? What is it called? It's a t-shirt, but more, it's, it's more sports wear. I, I had a kid at the high school I was teaching at that said it cost him $30 for the t-shirt, and I said, why? And he, I'll find you one at Target. And he said, well, it's got Hollister. And I thought, you fell, you fell, you fell hard for it. Branding, it's all about branding. Polly? Oh, yeah, the Disney, I think. Yeah, they got their own store. Mm -hmm. Another name you need up there is uh, North Face for winter wear. Oh, it, it, it seemed like every fifth person that got on the bus had something that said North Face. Yeah. Yeah. On the backpack or a little bit on the collar. It's discreet and tasteful, but you know it's there. Right? You know it's there. And you forgot about more shine shoes for men. And for kids, and for kids uh, Buster Brown and Red Goose shoes. <laughs> well, you're going to max it like, like Boss Slide. Sure, Buster Brown. There's one near uh, Brown House. Yeah. It was a, a German, uh, but there was a German label, it's still there in your brow. What's that called? Salamander and another kid's shoes. Can't wreck them, durable, tough shoes. Well, with some of those brands, you've got quality implied, you've got durability. I'm not sure what Hollister gives us but the same old t shirt or DKNY, the same old handbag. Now thought, but with the G on it for Gucci, or I'm not sure about durability on some of these items, whether they hold as well as Buster Brown or some of the brands you name. Kids, PF Flyers. I had to get one though that I see kids showing off with so often. And this, I put in here. See if it comes on the chair. Let me take my ball cap. Take my ball cap. Oh, here it is. All right. Right. You see these labels? And I don't know whether to wear it this way. I don't know where to wear it this way. Uh, but when you have these. You always got that mark for 45 minutes if you took it off. Yeah. But now it's very important to show this uh, kicker label. Right. Uh, uh, I'm not sure why, but that's become a status item. Shows it's authentic. Yeah, I used to cut those damn things off. <laughs> and now this is on here, and I'll tell the kids, Hey, you forgot to take that label off <laughs> last night when you bought that hat. He said, no, don't touch it. <laughs> 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 
And now, now, the way you wear your cap depends on your gang affiliation. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so, and the way you tip it, and yeah. the shoelaces you got on. But this one's boldly saying X. I'm not with anybody. I'm not for anybody. <laughs> you never know. That should say Cubs. <laughs> oh, hit me? Hit me. But anyway, it's the sticker now. you got to have the sticker. You gotta have that sticker, and I'll say, I'm sorry, you forgot to cut the label. No, no. Oh, Minnie Pearl was doing this. Oh, Minnie Pearl was doing that at uh, the Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> but I don't know. The branding's gotten outrageous, and, and you get the, the label on the sleeve now. So when you reach for something, you got the label. You got um, stuff that used to be. Inside the shirt, all over the shirt now. Yeah. I, somebody needs to explain it to me, and I should talk more to teenagers. That's advertising. Yeah, really. but here's the here's the joke. I'm not going to pay to advertise. That's your job, Mr. Retailer. Right. How did that happen? That I'm I'm paying the retailer to show his label. Something got turned around. Something got twisted. You know, don't buy the ads. They're thinking. The customer will wear it. Could you see that marketing ad? No, they're not going to wear the ad. I bet they do. I bet with enough ads in GQ, teens are going to start wearing our ad. Oh, you're kidding me. We're going to save 20% of our book marketing budget. Excuse me, but have you seen oh, the me? soccer game going on in TV lately? The guys are wearing uniforms with Everything on it. Office, yeah. Yeah. depot, yeah. beer. Yeah, not just Wilson and Spalding, but Mad all sorts star. of unrelated products. So sure, they get a sponsorship, they get an endorsement, they get a payoff, no doubt. But what does it say for sports? We're driving billboards. What does it say about sportsmanship? Um, I, I saw it all begin, this idea of advertising for you, not with apparel, but with beer. Uh, I got a wine bottle to show. Well, the Miller Time and the other beers, they always show it's not, it's not held this way, it's held that way. Well, that's the ad. That's the TV ad. Granted, I started seeing more and more in taverns, people holding the bottle. Look what I'm holding. Sort of a subliminal, I'm cool, I can afford Molson Gold, or I'm cool, I can afford, what do they call them now, craft beers, we used to call it home brewery, home Samuel beer, now it's craft beer. I got a craft beer in my mitt. I'm cool, let's see what I'm drinking. I'll purposely say, give me a glass, would you? And the bartender says, what glass? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, can I have a glass for the beer? I don't know if we got them. And he'll come out and give me a plastic cup. So you got a craft beer in a plastic cup now. But it's my way of saying I'm not going to hold the bottle. I'm not going to advertise for you. That's your marketing department's <coughs> job. But somehow we got to hold that bottle. The ad started it, and now, damn it, 90% of the folks in bars, especially young people, hold the bottle. And, and, and inadvertently, what you're doing is holding the label, what you're doing is wearing the billboard. Just like the kids wear the, wear the ad on the check. Well, they say, too, in uh, movies, when uh, if you can read the product label and it's a familiar, recognizable label, mm -hmm. the advertisers or the manufacturers pay mm -hmm. to, to have that product displayed in the movie. That's kickback, yeah. That branding has to be done by agreement, and we're going to have a we're going to have a meal scene, and could we show this product? Is how much would you pay Tom Cruise to even have it near him? And that's all that's all structured, no doubt. Have you seen the new uh, program called Fashion Star, where they have the designers on the on the air itself, and they actually have it out? In the stores oh. the same day? Next day. Next day? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some people call it pandering. Some people say, oh, that's a fast buck. Uh, I used to respect, say, De Niro. He used to make some pretty artful films, but now he does part two of Meet the Inla, part three of Meet the Inla. And I think artists can really pander, can't they? I, I just wonder. 
Tim talks about the long tail. And uh, what that does is, it is really recycle a product or resell a product without making a wholly new one. A longer tail, a longer price cycle, a longer point of purchase for that particular product. Uh, I can see some good. I'm not here to totally criticize every marketing scam that's out there, but I think in the long tail, it's good for shut-ins, this e-commerce. It's good for shut-ins, uh, people who just can't get to a retail store with the parking and the regional mall and all that old paradigm. It's good for shut-outs in that I wanted to start a hobby store, as Pauline was talking about, and how do I get myself marketed? I can't afford a lease. I can't afford uh, an inventory. The e-commerce puts you in the marketplace right away. So I think there's some wins in there for the little guy. Um, just to start a 7-Eleven, the trucking, the parking, that's short cycle selling where you have to have a structure before you can go into business. And the long tail or the longer cycle is e-commerce. Um, this recycling is terrific so that a hobby item, let's say a Buster Brown shoes or a Buster Brown sign, suddenly gains some sort of new value or added value as they say in economic textbooks. And pretty soon you're the cornering this this sort of item that you specialize in and that you're putting out in the market. Uh, beer trays from the basement, uh, what I call neo-antiques. Not something over 50 years or 100 years where you may need an, uh, a gloved outlet or a special storage, but something, say, from the 60s. And suddenly you've got a corner in that particular uh, item where you uh, can get it on, on eBay or online quickly. And it, it seems to open up new opportunities for people interested in capitalism, uh, as Charlie says. Well, I'm not a capitalist. I do want to make a plug for... <coughs> right, Charlie? Every week you're being... Let's go to the people's repository. People's food depository. Uh, the business you love to hate, as of the last six years, it's the banks. The banks, I lay the recession on the bank's doorsteps, and uh, Dr. Balkin talked to me about Ben Bernanke coming to town, Barney Frank coming to town. Will that be in April? Uh, sort of meeting the public, and there'll be a scholarly uh, symposium with our banking leaders um, and federal reservists. But, um, you know, I blame through the 20 yellows this easy, easy credit, uh, easy, easy mortgages, 0% financing frenzy that went on, particularly in auto sales, and uh, that kind of thing. And I think we get less and less uh, from our banks in that they don't want to be around uh, much to service you. I remember remember First National downtown, First National Bank Chicago. Remember the, the, the Eiffel Tower the, uh, at, at the uh, Chagall statue. We get uh, what was the later Bank One, but still a regional player, I think, from Ohio. Now it's totally gone and Chase is there taken over. Uh, I, I really don't think we get the same philanthropy that we got from a local bank like First National, but Chase is going to do what they want. Uh, this, um, I go back to First National where they started with visit us three times and pay a fee or talk to us twice and start paying a fee. They wanted to charge to walk up tellers. There was a real outcry against that. And uh, Bank one banked off, backed off of the idea of charging for each time they look you up and say, you've been here four times, we're going to start to debit you a little bit for all this talking to you, after all. <laughs> after all, talking to you. We want to move labor out of the picture, move the teller out of the picture. Well, they I think they want you to use ATMs. They do it with the ATMs. They got us out of the banks with the ATMs. Um, Cut lots of labor with the ATMs. Cut up lots of precious corners and city blocks with ATM 
drive-throughs as well. As CBS has with the drive-through drugs and Walgreens has it with the drive-through drugs. Now half their lot is uh, asphalt. Um, totally free checking. Do you believe it? No. It's never quite totally, totally free. They're all, they're breaking, they're bending over backwards with this totally free banner on the bank. And I'll say, all right, step one, do you pay, do you pay for my checks? Well, uh, it's totally free check. Do you pay for the paper? No, you'd pay a few bucks for the paper. You want a box of checks? Well, you're gonna pay eight, nine dollars for box of checks. It's never always a challenge them if it's totally free. Why am I paying for the check? Shouldn't the bank then pay for the check if it's totally free check? Um, so the auto debit I gotta mention because. They're constantly telling me, pay online, pay your bills online. Now get with it, Mr. Perry. You're still writing checks. Yeah. But do you ever try to get out of one of those debits? Like, right? Once you hook up the electric company, the gas company, the phone, the credit card, the mortgage, the banks know full well you're going to think twice about decoupling, right? <laughs> so they talk to you about how convenient it is for bill pay. But if you're going to move to a bank with a better deal, after all, isn't that free market, and search for a bank with better deals, higher interest, it's harder to walk. You're anchored to all those sign-ups for auto pay. And then you've got to back out each one. So you can't just tell the bank, take my six accounts out of here, or tell the next bank, or the credit union, here I am, Go get my six accounts from Bank of America, port them over to the credit union. You've got to go in and cancel each one. And that's a burden. I, maybe during the Q&A you can tell me how you can do that easier, but I find it hard to port that stuff out. There's companies that do it for you now. Okay. There, there's, another, there's a company that will do it for you. It's the perfect sort of... Uh, you got to pay about 50 bucks that to transfer it in. We work with a firm that will port your accounts, Mr. Perot, if you'd like to take them out. It might be Bank of America porting service. Anyway, we did stand up to Bank of America, I think, last summer, wasn't it? They... You want to pay for the debiting. That's right. Pay for debiting <coughs> and pay more for... What did they threaten to do? What was you pay ATM? Not the ATM. Those were okay. But if you used your debit card for purchases, I'll use your debit card. That's that's a. It's my money that I'm debiting out of my wages in your right your your bank that's dropped from my boss to your bank, and I got to pay a fee to port it out. It's not a credit card. It's not a credit. It's not carrying me on Mastercard, and I'll pay a fee for it. It's debiting my own sack of money. So a lot of people, there was a firestorm over that. I thought Bank of America won't give in, but BOA caved in on that and said, ah, we free thought it for not doing it. So sometimes public opinion can even stand up to a Goliath like BOA. I wonder what else we could do to beat them back. Maybe you can think of something during the one fool at a time. <laughs> presentation and give me more ideas. I was thinking about savings bonds. My own dad said, are those still around? And are they worth much? And I said, oh my God, that's true. That savings bond that he bought me when I was a little kid, I, I worry for. Maybe it's time to cash in, Dad, because I'm not sure what a U.S. savings bond will be worth in decades to come. You can't get a paper copy anymore. You can't get a paper copy? No, it stopped making paper copies. Ouch. You have to buy it directly now. Ouch. Don't go to a bank anymore. You can buy it directly from the Treasury. And the rates are tied to the market. The rates are tied to the market and floats. It's like, been a long time. Like college scholarships, floats with the market. And uh, raise the havoc in the And in the I am acknowledge for having sold uh, I think about ten million dollars in savings bonds. Who sold ten million in bonds? You sure. how'd you do that? Through the federal union? employees. Take um, stock in America. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> with the federal, federal employees. 
I did some good to be said in best in Uncle Sam, I suppose. It helped during World War II. War what? Bonds. War bonds. Big stock in America. Robo labor. This is your part, Charlie. Robo labor. Net gains. With the ATMs, I can't think of it. Well, you get your cash at night. If you're in a cab, you can go to an ATM at midnight and get some cash. Um, I've heard that with tollway tolling, those the plastic. Open road tolling. Open road tolling for that plastic thing that people break in your car to take now. Uh, that's yeah, convenient. Can. Because it opens more traffic flow. Oh, yes, it does. Uh, it does open traffic flow, although there are better ways. If you drive in Pennsylvania, you get off the highway to pay the toll. You don't stay on the highway and back up with the other guy. That was pretty simple, but then we'd have to employ people to take, take tolls, wouldn't it? Wouldn't we? So there are some benefits to this robo-labor, I suppose, if i got to get cash at midnight and if I'm in a eight car backups to pay my, my coins on the tollway, I suppose I would bank some automation. Losses though, I can think of more, can't you? With robo labor, of course you're putting uh, workers out of, out of the job, which in turn puts somebody else out of a customer. And when I thought of the biggest loss for automation, I think it was the, uh, I think it was self-serve gas, where, where they always, you know, where, can I get some help this January? I'm free. Can I get some help with the pump? Well, we did away with the with the clerk. You can't get the gas pump, but we brought down what they say prices. We brought down prices for you. Which would you rather have, Mr. Barrow? Help at the pump or lower prices? That worked through the 80s, but after all. What have we got now? Sky high prices and a guy who's attached to the potato chip counter, like he won't move, right? He takes your cash through a bulletproof piece of glass, sells you some junk food. If you got a tire problem, I'm sorry, you know, call AAA, he won't move. He's just there to take your cash. So that's a net loss. That to me is a big net loss. Um, the checkout lines are still the debate. If you go into CVS now on the north side, some are half automated, some are half clerk. Right, right. CVS um, on uh, near Division in Ashland, and here half half clerk. They're going full speed ahead on that more than Walgreens to try to automate those tellers, <coughs> those checkouts. I should say, I'm not at the bank anymore. Sorry. Uh, of course, it's a net loss for labor. But they'll tell you, no, it's a net gain for you because we don't employ a clerk, we can bring your prices down. Uh -huh. When everybody's automated in the drug world, they can raise their prices anyway. Where are we going to go? And that's another firm, by the way, that's been um, totally chain gang drugstores. You can barely find one. There's one in, uh, there's one up on Irving called Mertz's, but they charge a lot to be independent and privately owned, family owned. Uh, there's one in Oak Park. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to move quickly about back to basics. A little out of order, but it's what I'd like to see the banks do. For every job you've added, Mr. Obama should have said, we'll loan you a do a, you set the rate, $500, $1,000. For every job you add, we'll loan you more money. But instead, it's get lean, they cut jobs, they got the loans anyway. Uh, the way they take the corners, I think, is uh, take over corners and park those cash machines, I think, is pretty hideous. And uh, let's bring back the savings and loans that put more money in circulation, not fees. It's been 30 years of the fees squeeze since first hey, You know, I think you kind of forget about the savings and loan scandal that us uh, oh, citizens oh, had to pay for <coughs> because of the fact that they stopped, uh, Reagan stopped the auditing yeah. and then the uh, people in the savings and loans went crazy yeah. with their programs. Yeah. They ran them into the ba uh, ground and, and then, then us poor citizens had to guarantee them out of our yeah. tax money. Hey, that's how George Bush made some money. I don't want to um, go back to that. 
Silverado's candle in Texas shows that savings and loans were not above reproach. Still, we've got a credit union that still seems to do fairly well in Chicago for teachers and for other uh, public employees. Um, and I've only got a couple slides left, I promise I, I'm using more time than I, I wanted to, but these are things that have aggravated me the last 10 years that I just wanted to get on the table. Um, I remember when coffee was a diner experience. Remember, you go into a diner, or so many in Chicago, blue plate special type diner places, and, and they'd let you stay, or, or you'd stay long, long enough to read a, a Sun Time page or two. Now, when I go, into coffee shops like Starbucks, they're set up like they're doing a uh, research dissertation. You've got your, your laptop, you've got your tablet, your cell phone, you've got papers all over. And yet, they don't say, we'd be leaving so we'd be ordering more. They seem to let you stay. And that's a whole new ethos in, in, fast, in food, in dining. Um, remember the White Castle, the Portillo's? You eat it, beat it. And now they've got tables attached to the floor, and they encourage you to stay and bring the family and eat. And I think they've ration, ration, uh, rationalized that um, eat and beat it doesn't always make profit, that it's get them to stay, get them to stay, and put out more bubbles, and put out more fast foods and things to take uh, to your table. The free Wi-Fi now? Yeah. you guys eat it <laughs> no, they, they, they get three hours here for five bucks, so they're still in the old school here. I think it, one thing you're overlooking, though, it's staying, is that you'll probably spend more money on your visit than if I, you ate in Ryan. I think that's the conclusion, that read a novel, buy a sandwich. Go to Panera Not just Bread. stay for the Sun-Times column, read where I go and run, and go, go up the, the coffee. Some places are killing the wife, and those right, get people out of it. That's what was in the paper last week. Uh, McDonald's makes it pretty free and public. I see a lot of people stay at McDonald's with a 60 cent coffee and uh, their seniors and that read all day still. Um, quick turnover no longer seems to be the objective in buying. The book business fascinates me. I'll go to an area I seem to know more, more about. I spent more of my life in education than anything else. Teaching. And uh, it was. Uh, now it's have a brownie, read a book, right? Browse a book. Remember at Crocs when you could read as long as you could stand. You'd lean, or at Walden you'd lean and you get tired. And in the indie bookstore they say, you going to buy that? And I'll say, pardon? I'll say, you're going to buy that because you're really picking up that book. Would you, would you move on? Please don't drink near the books. You know, spill something on the books. Don't get the books sticky. They turn all that around to Take an easy chair, make it more like your living room, and the whole idea was take the cookie by the, by the box. If you take one, you may come back and buy the book, you may get shagged and snagged on the book, and take the book by the book. The best example of that was the old Porter's music uh, stations. And I called them music appetizers. Because you'd get a minute of the CD if you scanned it, and that would be the taste you needed then to buy the whole CD. Very insidious, very, very, <laughs> very, very clever, I thought, on the part of the marketers. Uh, How many bookstores are there around anymore? Yeah. Anymore. But even the big box books had quite a run. Borders didn't keep up with the uh, university market like Barnes did. And the university market and the textbook business saved uh, Barnes, is my opinion, where Borders was asleep at the wheel on that one. Uh, so, um, and I remember when ads were something you could sort of black out or turn off, especially on, on the TV. And now, I even see embeds on the, on the station, right? You see the oxygen, the meat yeah. TV, the embeds are on the corner. So it's very, very subliminal, you're watching Me TV, you're watching Me Too. Um, and cable bungling. Right? I mean, they, 15 years ago, decided we want his cell phone, we want his TV, we want his internet with us. There's a lot of bundling, whereas maybe when I was a teenager it was not, what do you pay, what do you pay per month, which seems to be the cocktail talk now. It was paper, it was um, not whether you pay, but you know, um, what do you pay per view. 
everything's pay-per-view. So, what, so what, young kids now take it for granted that they're going to pay for, have to pay for what they view. Whereas I think for many people in this room, it was more like a public utility, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. the majors, uh, now we've got 40, 50 stations we subscribe and buy into. I'll stop with school. School is not beyond franchising. If you look into these um, DeBry, uh, Phoenix organizations that pop up online, Corinthians, Strayer College out in Oak Brook, you see them on office towers, nothing but a neon sign is the campus. Uh, if you also look on uh, Wall Street Journal and on the Dow, you'll see these are corporations. I uh, don't think DeVry is beyond it. DeVry is a corporate entity for profit university. And they take a kind of mask of being a college, which we've been conditioned to think, well, that's not profit. Not anymore. And some of them have gotten into some big trouble by admissions offices luring kids into federal loans. And once you sign on to those things after eight or ten weeks, if you drop out and can't do it, the schools keep the entire flow, especially with those Perkins grants. You get past the drop period, the consumer, unwary, uh, often loses it and goes into debt. And that's through very, very aggressive marketing, so you're selling school slots as you would uh, insurance, for example, or cars. Uh, but you see them growing up in the suburbs more and more, and even the the, class, the real nonprofits like the Paul Loyola are out in the burbs in, in some of these office office towers that you see it around Schaumburg, around O'Hare, uh, trying to change with the times and adapt with uh, the adult market. I'll, I'll close with schools, um, and the question, can you really go to college, as we think of it, online? I had some doubt about the whole degree online, but you certainly can get a master's degree online from accredited schools today. Uh, I don't know if it's a net loss or net saving. Uh, I know you'll save some money, but I think in terms of the personal experience of college and collegiality and building relationships, the social value of college is torn by the online degree. So those are some of my thoughts on the new, the new market in America. Uh, and I think what I've been talking about are reinventions was the idea. Reinvention. Uh, that capitalism, if it's going to survive, has decided to try all sorts of new ideas to uh, often <coughs> cut labor cut materials in this long tail recycling we talked about, uh, cut costs, definitely, and transportation on all those old school mechanisms uh, to create a new school of commerce or a new, new brand of capitalism. I think consumers are sometimes, often, in my view, at a net loss for these things, although sometimes we do save, save dollars and gain some convenience, admittedly. Uh, my verdict is uh, a net loss in many cases, and you can debate that in the Q&A. You can debate that, too, in the one bullet attack. So I'll close with that. Thank you. All right, Peter, you know, I, I appreciate your thing, but you seem to be forgetting some of the other... Where does... What is your opinion? You know, this, this cycle of reinventing has been going on for quite a while. We've seen it as early as with the Wells Fargo wagons, and now it's UPS. <laughs> And we've seen it again with the rise of Sears and Roebuck and the fall of Sears and Roebuck and now the rise of Walmart. Isn't this kind of what capitalism does to keep a fresh face on making products or is it something that you think is a bad thing? I mean, people's money go where they want to buy and that's what they're trying to do. Less and less so you can't 
can walk with your money less and less so with this era of <laughs> concentration, and by that I come back to the banks, that they have so much clout. I come back to the idea that, what are the three biggies engrossing now? Uh, Feather, <laughs> Safeway. Uh, there's two or three grocers that have 80% of the American market. How far can you walk with your dollars? Albertson who joined and took Jewel. And the largest market now was Walmart. And Walmart moving into... Super centers. Making the grocers cringe for what's coming. The thousand pound gorilla. All right, I can, I can walk with my money from one jeweler to the next, from Robinson jeweler to the guy down the block. There's choice. How far can I walk with my grocery dollar anymore? And so I say there is less choice in certain sectors of this economy, and it's gotten worse in the last decade. Depends on your product. Okay. Uh, I, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, women really got into knitting again. And some uh, old products have resurgences, like Doc Martin. Do you have any philosophy or any um, explanation for why an old product would all of a sudden become super chic again, like Hush Puppies mm -hmm. did, or... Um... That's my puppies. Does that mean Schwinn will come back? Oh my god. No, somebody bought the Schwinn label, I see, I believe. You can buy the label, but you can't always make the product. Uh, I think my answer to that is, think, Graham, I can't see. Uh, things get so bad, the old look good. And if the old stays good, by that I mean quality, or can re rebuild itself out of quality, and re they can regain a toehold in that market. Um, Florsheim is, is probably made somewhere now. I heard they moved, oh no, that was Hartshaven in March. Now they're offshore. If they make that product in a shoddy manner, they've lost a whole lot of faith in the label. So then, uh, Botany 500 or someone will come back and, and try to regain the ground. And if they make it well enough, people will pay more for that, for that product. They've lost their faith in the floor shine, so they may pay more for Doc Martin now. Uh, if Doc Martin can hold fast to his old reputation, there's a way to regain some ground in that. It's tough. It's a tough road. And I'm not a marketing specialist as much as a historian, and I like to look in perspective at decades. We have some economists here, though, like uh, Dr. Bolton. Isn't Dr. Martin the shoe you were refer referring to? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Just, uh, and Hush Puppy. I'm just going to comment on your basic question, are we better off with the new capitalism? And it's like the preacher said, the big print giveth, the little print taketh away. All of these innovations that we have to lower have not offset the fact that the living standard today is much less than when I was young. I used to be able to walk into a restaurant and they'd have a sirloin steak for five dollars over an iron plate. Uh, you could go to Pixley and Islers and get all kinds of fruit. It used to be that one breadwinner was enough to support a family. And we had a car and the kids could go to a Boy Scout camp or something like that. And they could take a trip to Wisconsin. Today, what has happened is that with the lower prices, we have purchased uh, one out of six people that is unemployed. We have all kinds so of promotions to Don't sell marketing, but nothing to build manufacturing. We, I mean, we, have, we are pants pressers, and the people that manufacture are offshore. And when all we're doing is we're taking the profits that they have, they invested in bonds, and we become perpetual debtors to okay, pay them man. off indefinitely. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Here's his question. How do you explain <laughs> that? <laughs> 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 
And what do you think about I mean, that? I'll, I'll use one example. If you're a good pants presser, sir, someone will need you, as there are good tailors in this town that can still be independent. But somehow capitalism figures out a way to do away with pressing. Well, we don't need the pants presser anymore because we've invented state press. And we think, well, God, I don't have to do pressing so much. I'm going to save time. So they convince us that we may be, uh, uh, well, well, uh, Dr. Lichtenberg, one of the guys who smashed the machine, Luddites, that you can't smash the machine always uh, and go backward. Uh, so the old pants pressure is just about gone. Yes. Uh, do you think. I gotta get rid of it. What's that? Pressing this. Or you, or you got another one No, no, no. Please. I'm not advertising. Unless they want to come in and. Subsidize my book. Uh, there you go. Uh, uh, to the extent uh, this, that you alluded to these things in your uh, presentation, is offshoring uh, and, and the global economy a good thing or a bad thing? I'd say net loss on that. I'd say net loss on offshoring. Thank Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, and, and now uh, Obama wants CAFTA as well as NAFTA with more South American import agreements and cross no. uh, construction of product in Central America. And our domestic community suffers with that. You say that Walmart, but the net losses to our domestic community as if we raise the bottom. Bottom sometimes being the cheapest product we can import. And, 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 uh, we, people say that, okay, the, we can quantify the savings, and in certain specific cases, we can quantify the losses when a plant closes or something. But has anybody done an analysis of any one against the other? Or a caption on it? Yeah. Look at the nickel and dime, read that, is my answer. That many times people selling the goods or serving the goods can't afford the very steak they're serving up. Then where are the net loss if you want some sort of quantification? How many folks can't afford the thing they make, sell, serve? That's a big question there. <coughs> and you could quantify that. I, I'm sure you could. The West. <laughs> is the union what? <laughs> I think it is in reinventing itself. The union is. We had Larry Spivak last a couple weeks ago, and. Uh, he talked about many ways the union is reinventing itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hi. Um, you started off the presentation with talking to find the nature of number and Google or Yahoo. How do I do it? No, Can you speak up, please? The no 800 number at Google or email at, at Google company. And, and the banks and ATMs. And my question is a socio question. And, and what impact this will have on the economy? Our fear of intimacy. We don't want to interact with, with one another. That's what I hear. And they the might fear of intimacy. Home, and the pressure that is going to put economically on the society of resources. Um, and what's your feeling on that? Um, I, I think there's a new individualism. She said it's partly social relationships that are causing some of these conundrums, like no way to call Hotmail or Google and talk to a, a person to walk me through. Uh, as a teacher, we used to tell the kid, figure it out for yourself. And with some self-evident problems, that's a good exercise for the kid. But if I've spent hours and I can't undo the web problem, I think they have to stand up to their product and put a person in place to help me with a human voice walk through it. I have learned on my own to puzzle it out, but I've wasted uh, but through, through the web instead of ask for voice. Sometimes I'm proud of that, but I spend an inordinate amount of hours trying to puzzle through something. There has to be an alternative for those who like, still like to talk to people to dial an 800. If Skippy can do it, 
Over peanut butter, I think Yahoo can leave us an 800 number for those of us not born into technology. I think it's an awful affront for them to sort of hold us out of, of, of uh, service and yet hook this on, hook most of us onto the web. Give me a real question now before, because I'm a question. Not just one of your phony questions, yeah. a real question here. March. Why don't we need the Chinese shirt laundry? Oh, yeah. yeah, they've got shirts for a buck on Michigan at South Michigan. My God, do they hustle in there. And I just stand and watch the contraptions come down, steaming those shirts and all. It's a buck. The buck for shirt, I think, how can they do it? It's not Chinese. All sorts of people, students, people of color are working in that laundry. They've got to pull up and you bring in the laundry and you... People still need, need that service. And, you know, the other day, uh, in Little Italy, where I lived, there was a young student type, university student, running down Taylor Street. And I thought, oh, he needs help, or maybe he's running from a, a police, uh, the police, uh, some sort of emergency. I'm going to follow and see where he goes. And I, I tried to catch up. He was parking a car for someone. The guy was leaping down the sidewalk to make an extra buck because he's a valet. And I thought, coolly, you know, coolly, <laughs> in our own country now, our workers are like we used to refer to coolly labor with the little rickshaw in colonial countries, pulling that thing. And I talked to uh, Larry Spivak's discussion about going into a Mexican restaurant largely with Hispanics and the mom, European background, with her kid going from table to table asking for coins. And most of the Hispanic customers didn't understand her English. And I thought, this is what I used to see in Latin America as I traveled, that, uh, Little kids from the street would come into the tourist restaurants in Mexico and ask for coin. And I was in a north side restaurant on Fullerton, and our own citizens were begging for coin. And the uh, locals didn't understand what she was saying in English and didn't give her coin. So they walked out. So that's the race to the bottom, folks. And, uh, net gains with price, with quality of life. It, it, you can give so many examples. Okay. We're lining up for the pool. Ho, ho, ho. For your discussion. Yes, Karina. Um, I have a question to you, just a bit of a challenging one. But you're on your car, you've had a long drive, been in your car for a couple of hours, you're on the highway, and there's two burger stands, and one of them has an M. The golden M on top of it, aren't you more likely to go to the one that has mm. that McDonald's sign on top of it because you'll know what you get versus Joe Schmo's? McDonald's is a hard uh, formula to fight. Uh, they've had some winning formulas that are emulated and admired by capitalists around the world. They do have some benevolent programs and social concerns. Uh, every time they get in a corner about the burgers or some other item, they reinvent another one, right? And I don't mean shamrock shakes, but they'll come up with salad for a dollar and lots of ways to sidestep what Burger King's paid a, a big price for. First of all, the name was short-sighted. On Burger King's part, that was suicide. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken got out of it quickly, and now uh, what are they, Kentucky or... KFC uncle or something more endearing, KFC. They wiggled out of it, but Burger King still stuck with the word burger, which is short sight. But McDonald's is constantly wiggling out of being the villain. Um, and it takes courage to say, I won't go in there, it's cheaper, but I'll go to Joe's Pancake Thanks. House or something. It Ooh. takes courage Sorry. today and a little Sorry. bit of extra money to buck that like McDonald's bucket. So you yourself are susceptible oh. or to what they call goodwill. In the I'm um, 
I'm susceptible. I've been known to go in those places. It's very uh, compelling, let me say, and they know it. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, Doug Boucher, Doug yeah. Bob Matter. Okay, uh, in your uh, in the description of yourself in the uh, flyer here, says you're an educator. Yeah. And one of the things I, uh, this is going to be regards to the people seeking jobs in the marketplace out of high school. And I was listening to a program the other day, I forget now uh, what it was, but at any rate, it was, the, there's a manufacturer guy in Peoria, Illinois, and he has very sophisticated manufacturing equipment. And he's got positions that he cannot fill because the people that are coming to him are not qualified to run these computerized machines. And at the same time, you know, these are like high school students that aren't being trained to, to do this. And I was wondering, you know, with, with a lot, so many opportunities, that it really it's hard to get a good slot in this day and age, is what are the educators doing to prepare students for the new marketplace? I, I lay that on the footsteps of the educator. I lay the blame on the teachers and the education system that we have not kept pace or trained the workforce. Uh, I never thought there was anything wrong with vocational programs in Chicago like CBS, like Lane Tech, and yet our architects of, of schooling gave us instead of uh, other other tracks and college track is clearly dominant and clearly the the emphasis of the money college prep track well then when you get to college what do you get what do all those kids get at the door when they get there um, not always studies that help manufacturing survive I'd like to see it come back in a big way I don't think Obama has said much about vocational education and I think we need it for teens. And I don't mean just hotel service work, but machine calibration and that sort of thing. But we've laid waste to it and put all money on college prep. College prep. That puts the onus on colleges to do something. Okay, okay Bob Matter and then uh, Walter Collins. Okay, uh, Peter, you made this comment about uh, you know, Walmart giving back to the community, and you think Target gives back more, etc. Um, where, where does this idea come from that that it's, it should be the purpose of a business to give back to a community? Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. Isn't well, it enough that Walmart gives us, you know, 25 percent lower yeah. prices? Yeah. Uh, they uh, they have to. They should they call they have to donate to a food bank yeah. and an animal shelter. So oh, yeah. 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 Screw that. Yeah. They call one. Does anyone else want to take them on that? Take them up on that's a lot of I like to uh, uh, yeah. yeah. uh, I'll tell you who brought that up and it was let's go to Andrew Carnegie. As vicious as he was in his last years, he thought it might be a good idea to get some of my prosperity back for public libraries. Oh. And on and on. So we get Carnegie Mellon University, Mellon another shrew yeah. in banking, teamed up and gave back. But, alas, in America, there's nothing that says you have to under capitalism. You don't have to tithe. Uh, they would say taxes are, are, the, are the pain or the price, but you don't have to give back. Those who do are, I think, pretty shrewd because it not only improves image, but it salves their conscience. Yeah, they got poor health. Hello. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. Oh, Others take it. Yes, Walter. Getting back to vocational training, could you fault a young man today for not bothering with learning how to run sophisticated machines after he's seen his father and his uncles and his cousins yeah. all get laid off, the job shipped out of the country? When you, uh, you really couldn't fault young people today for not going after the price, their college um, education. Uh, Avoiding the tip-off. The old Greek socket machinery, though, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are largely dinosaur. In that when we talk about calibrations and things people in this room may know more about, 
CAD CAM. CAD CAM manufacturing and all. It's, it's very sophisticated and respectable and not as physically wearing. Although, you know, studies come out on the eyes and the stress and the strain, but you can get some real respect in a profession and on the job uh, in some of these um, high, highly tooled uh, systems that exist out there. So it's not your old man's steel mill anymore. I think even Mr. Spivak told us a couple weeks ago about that. Yeah, but even the new sophisticated places, they turn around and get rid of people. Like, oh, yeah. for instance, oh, electro, electromotive yeah. up in Canada just told the workers to take a 50% pay cut. They closed the, the place down. Yeah. Yeah. And they built the a new factory set, I mean, in uh, Muncie, Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. Mexico. Yeah, and it's uh, still uh, old fashioned, but, but even that, work teams now, people are in these work yeah. teams and so on, uh, uh, set their own pacing and all this. Uh, supposed to be progressive now. And, uh, <laughs> And bottom line, though, it's it's what the board of directors want. Sure, Charlie, Charles, yeah, I, I, Peter, aren't you looking something here? I, it eludes me what the value, what value is added by all this retailing. I there's about five thousand products in it, the Aldi stores you were talking about. Wouldn't it be better to nationalize the food industry so that we could just go to the People's Food Depository with a, a sack and get food? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what's the value added of any of this activity that you outline? Nothing. What, clothes with writing on it? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, don't wear, well, I don't wear wonderful clothing with writing on it. Uh, well, yeah, you've got a lot of clothes. The siren song of labeling, branding, status, envy. It's always, it's very, it's very compelling. It's, it's elusive. And by spending 20% of their budget, they can make a whole lot more back by marketing and clever branding. But you're right, in the end, we only need one sort of sedan. We only need one sort of lawnmower, more or less. Sears to do. If you want to ride one, go ahead. Run like a deer. Bob <laughs> Lichtenberg. That's the answer. I was going to reply to Bob Matter when he asked, but I turned that into a question. Do you think that uh, these new forms of reinventing business today are driven just by sheer greed? just monetary profit, and that's it, and they don't you know, care about um, their responsibility to society, the fact that they go after the money, should they, uh, you know, give a little bit back, especially to schools, if they want their students to, um, their employees to uh, be able to follow directions and things like that. So it's all about greed. I, I don't want to be one-dimensional and say, all about greed because we do see some gains from these thrift stores, by the way. I mean, these kinds of things are truly this, this idea of recycling material and then bringing cost benefits to us. Good idea, dollar stores less so, but uh, I don't know, there's some benefits to it. In the end, they're all, they're all run by corporate boards, and, and you know what the bottom line is, but. Some of these things are so creative and clever. If I'm the shut-in or the shut-out, for example, I'm, I'm glad there's there's internet, and I don't see that as necessarily a conspiracy to make money or an evil intention. Still in all those other things like branding that I see that are insidious. This idea of my kid walking around with an ad on his back. Somehow things got turned around. The kid reads things into it that's that's glamorous, but that's an insidious plot, I think. But but R and D and new products can benefit us in the end. Certainly in healthcare, we've seen some tremendous strides that have been motivated by Bosch, Bayer, you name it, Abbott Labs. But we're living longer. That's a net result. Big farm. Yes. Big pharmaceutical. But I'm not willing to write it all off yet as, as corporate greed. 
getting us up in the morning. It's just not, things aren't that simple for me. For me. Let's go to rebuttals. Okay. No more questions? Let's go to I rebuttals. Will. I will say there are books here. I came once and talked about... all your questions. From... I did. I came here and talked about... Uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not selling shit. Oh, oh, get out of here. What are you selling? Yeah. 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 Peter, talk store. about your product and what you're trying to sell. My bookstore. I don't have a t-shirt yet. Yeah. For our Arcadia books. Tell us about your books, Peter. <laughs> there you go. You've seen them before. I gave a slide talk on the history of neighborhoods and ethnics. They're here. That's more my comfort zone than economics. Those are the ones about um, Pilsen and okay. the Italians. Pilsen and the Italians. Haven't written any more. Not sorry. yet. Uh, oh, Peter, I'm really oh, cool. There is one more question. One fool at a time, please. Do I have it? Do I have it? I know. Eight twenty-eight. Thank you. Fire away. All right, you have a rebuttal or what? What's going on? Oh, oh my God. Oh, 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 my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my Oh, my my question is the amount of floor space that is used in these big boxes. Oh, good. Bob Matt is going to get I can hardly wait. The amount of they use. Well, so they do it off the computer. It's very rich. All these is one of the narrowest. Yes, floor space goes into the equation. All these narrow, they know that. Target's known for being much wider, and they know that. They create a comfort zone or a reason to be there. All these has a different impression they give. The fluorescent tube versus the indirect light that you get at Target. There's a, a lot of psychology in that. I'm thinking more of the, the fact that they can host so many products in one space. They can offer it as a lower, uh, make a lower margin. Yeah. And do what happened products? to Cub? Somebody tell me. Answer. I am in a Cub food. They so folded with, with the team. Yeah. They are now Strachan <laughs> Van Til over here on. Uh, <laughs> they seem to be doing things well with Cub, and now uh, they disappeared, so they weren't doing so well. Well, they got a new manager now, so they'll be coming back. <laughs> <laughs> he said Cub, not Cubs. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Let's go to rebuttals, Brahma. People are chomping at the bit. We're ready to move on to rebuttals. All right. Uh, Joined the, the musical chair brigade. How about one more round of applause for our speaker? Uh, five six minutes, minutes. Rob. Right. Five, five minutes each. Uh, six, six. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, just wait a minute. It's uh, 9.55. I'll sell my thing. So you got a full hour. <laughs> hey, Brom, I got to stop watching the phone. I'll, uh, I'll time. Either me or Paul. And uh, we'll... we'll uh, I'll give you guys a heads up or something with a signal. Start, start with six minutes. Let's see how that goes. No, we'll go at five because there's going to be more people who will be inspired, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Inspired by you guys. Of course. We'll start with Francisco Aguilar. Inspired? 
<laughs> it, it, it is sad to me to, to be here tonight. Uh, the thing that I, that I see is that we are eating up the world, and uh, people encourage me to tell you about the plastic shit that we are creating, and we form it in different colors and things, and we start all in yeah. Louder, Frank. Louder, Frank. Louder, Frank. Uh, people encourage me to keep mentioning about the plastic shit that we are surrounded by. Uh, you have to remember, every one of you, especially the young people here, you have to remember that everything that is built in this world, every pyramid, any bridge, any tower, any automobile, it was built by these hands. Your hands, my hands. And the product of our labor is being channeled by bullshit, by plastic shit, into a few people who control and manipulate all this. And we are left with nothing. A depleted world, a destroyed world, a sea without fish, a bird, a, 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 an, an air without birds and butterflies. And I think that we're missing a lot by not considering that all this productivity, all this manufacturing faster and faster I have come in the last few hundred years. Uh, and this is another thing that we uh, we don't uh, take account of is the lack of respect that we have. The kids in the school don't respect the teachers. The people is here when somebody's talking are going into their own little thing chat and uh, ignoring that if they come here and somebody come to express their ideas is supposed to have some value for all of us. In any case, that we are invaded by a total lack of reason. Uh, we are not listening to the science, the physics, the chemistry, the whole thing that we are learning or that the scientists and science are learning, but we are ignoring. We are using religion to justify our bullshit. A few weeks ago, we have a person here that justify mosquitoes having souls <laughs> because quantum mechanics tells us so. And in a few weeks, you will have somebody who will tell you that uh, string theory tells you that God exists. And what a lack of honesty and what a lack of understanding of what we are trying to understand about the universe we live in. If we continue in this manner in a few years, the seas will be depleted of life. The seas will not have enough plankton to replace the oxygen that we breathe. This is not a theory. This is fact. This is things that they are happening and continue to happen faster and faster and faster. And the more we manufacture with automatic machines and with computerized robots, the faster we are depleting our earth. And this is sad. I want to thank Peter for drawing, through his analysis, uh, our own observations, our own dissatisfaction with what exists today. Um, as far as branding goes, there's a, a, a strange thing going on. You can buy a Cadillac today for $26,000, and you can buy a Chevy for $37,000, and there's some, there's some imbalance there, but the brand is always important. 
Uh, as far as the 800 numbers and the other people who don't want to talk to us when we need them, uh, when I do get a hold of someone like that, uh, and they, uh, there's always a recording when you reach it that says, uh, uh, this, re the, this conversation may be recorded for quality control purposes. When I speak to the person, I always tell them uh, that uh, I am a consultant and I charge $145 an hour for my uh, contributions to your quality control. You can make the check payable immediately. Um, yesterday, I was the, uh, for, for the tenth year, I was a, a judge at the Chicago Public Schools Student Science Fair. And uh, Peter mentioned the uh, uh, vocational schools, uh, Lane Tech, uh, Chicago Vocational High School, and so forth, Chicago Agricultural School on the southwest side. Uh, I was a judge in the physics uh, department uh, with that, and yeah, I was amazed at the number of uh, students from Lane Tech, from CVS, and uh, from the Chicago Agricultural School. Uh, their experiments, their d demonstrations were far superior to any of the other schools, including the so-called magnet schools in Chicago. I was very much impressed with that. So the, the concept of the uh, Trade school, it's great. They do it in Europe all the time. But it's also, uh, the, the basic education gives the impetus to the students to go beyond that. Well, my name is Gene Anderson, and uh, I'm going to talk about the other market. Not the commercial market that the speaker was talking about, but the other market that is bigger and came before the one that Mr. Payroll was talking about. And I want to mention some of the architects and the people that contributed to this market that I'm talking about. And I'll mention folks like Thomas Hobb, John Russo, John Locke, one of the hopes that it a Greek classic, and I'll mention others. And I'm only doing this to get to a conclusion where I can make a final statement. I only got five minutes, so whatever I talk about will be shown in unclarified. Now, I want to start with religion. And when I say religion, I'm talking about Judeo-Christian religion. However, since I'm familiar with the Old and New Testament, and I'm also familiar with the classic, I have to mention the classic first, for the simple reason that the Old and New Testament is just an extension of the classic, are the best plagiarizing I ever seen, or the biggest coincidence that I ever seen. So I'll start with uh, 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 Prometheus and his brother uh, Epimetheus. Uh, uh, if you remember, Prometheus gave human uh, fat and upset the God too. Well, his brother was kind of scatterbrained, so he looked at man and saw man was on all four. He felt sorry for him. Man's cerebral capacity was very weak, so he gave <coughs> intelligence and put man upright. That was the brother. And in so the God, Zeus, that was mad, he punished both of them uh, severely. Now we can go all uh, to go to the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, and we can uh, uh, read the Mosaic Law, Book 1 and 2, Deuteronomy, and you can see there that here man telling other men what to do, how to act, how to relate to the wife, how to make sex, and how they treat the animal, and everything else. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, extended it. Now, we'll go, I'll come to what we can really identify with, because we living in the United States particularly is very influenced by these people. Thomas Hobbes, talking about the state of nature, and only way Time is up? Yep.
That ain't no five minutes. Give me a goddamn break. <laughs> Five thirty one. It was five minutes. It was. That was five minutes. Five thirty one. Okay, well thanks Peter for uh, uh, interesting conversation. Um, made a couple notes here. Uh, branding. Uh, branding I I myself find quite important. I'm a and I'm a big uh, e e shopping fan, a big eBay fan. Uh, branding lets me know what I'm getting. You know, uh, when I'm buying something, I know, you know, for instance, I know uh, uh, I like uh, Joseph and Feist dress shirts for work. <laughs> I know they, I know that they, the size fits me. I know that they're good quality, and I just like them all around. So I search those out. I won't buy just some generic, no-name shirt. I want to buy. Something like that. There's a couple other brands that I look for that I, because I know the, the quality, and that's important when you can't see something when you're doing e shop, you know, eBay shopping. I may be buying, it may be new without tags, it may be uh, used or you know, mint condition or whatever, but it may be from somebody in California. You can't look at it and see it, uh, but you know the quality. Same thing, with bike bike parts. You know, is another good example. There's certain uh, brands of bike parts that are that are just uh, well known for their quality and. Uh, you, you know, you buy those particular brands, you know that it's going to fit, that it's going to be finished well, it's going to be made out of good material, you're going to get a good value for your money. So I think, uh, so I think branding is real important and that's what I like. Spending up, you know, coffee, let's look at coffee and food. I mean, you know, I know when I go to a Starbucks, no matter where I go in the country uh, and have a Starbucks, I know that I'm going to get that consistent, top quality, dark roast that I, that I love. Uh, at McDonald's, I know what I'm getting when I go to McDonald's. So. Uh, and there are all kinds of other places. I uh, Mr. Perro mentioned quite a few of them, but you know, there's all kinds. Of, there's still room. You know, when I hear when I hear these small liberals whining about Walmart, how they put small businesses out of uh, business and blah blah, and they destroy Main Street. Blah, blah. You know, there's all you can think of all kinds of businesses that Walmart doesn't really affect. For instance. Uh, bike shops as far as doing repair on bike shops, I mean doing repair, decent quality bikes. Walmart doesn't sell decent quality bikes, so serious bike people don't buy bikes at Walmart. Uh, serious bike people that buy a good quality bike that they use for transportation, but they don't want the brake handles to snap off when they squeeze them when a bus is coming or something. You know, if you go to a bike shop and you spend $400 or more and you get a decent quality bike, Decent components and things like that. But anyway, bike shops, florists, barber shops, you know, uh, vision places. Although I did buy, I did, I did buy a pair of glasses from Walmart one time, from a Walmart vision place, and eh, I wasn't really that happy with the experience. Uh, so the last time I got glasses, I went to a, a small local guy and paid more money. Uh, now, this, this idea about, okay, these ATM machines putting towelers out of work, and all this automation putting people out of work. We need to lay this myth to rest. Uh, a good thing to do would be to read Essays in Political Economy by Frederick Bastiat. <laughs> you can listen to this on LibriVox.org. You can download it and listen to it, or you can read it for free on Project Gutenberg because it's, you know, in the public domain. But he explains this quite well with some of his, with some of his parables. And here's the thing: you, if, if, a, if, a, if a company has a, you know, two workers, they're making some product, and the owner figures out a way to make this product with only one worker by you know, maybe some good invention of pulleys and ropes or whatever. Uh, if he relieves one worker, that worker goes into the workforce, but also the money he paid that worker stays there with the company. And what usually happens is the price gets lowered of the product. Yeah. No, so the same fine. amount of money, the uh, same amount of production is going out now, right? Same amount of production going out for less money, and that worker generally is going to find employment shortly thereafter somewhere else, making something else, also being product productive. So what happens? Society, look at the benefits society is getting. Our production is increasing. In other words, our wealth. Wealth is stuff. The exertion of labor and labor on natural exertion. Uh, so society benefits. There's more production. Now we have two people in the 
you know, still two people, you know, that employed, although now at different places, but they're both employed, they're both producing, but guess what? But the price, total price paid for products, is lower. This guy's to be <coughs> so we're so we benefited. But anyway, we're gonna talk about that May 14th at the Henry George School so we're gonna Time. discuss that that book, so we'll pick it up and read it. Uh, status, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, people use brands for status. Like I said, I use brands as a as a way to determine quality, but I uh, highly recommend reading Theory of the Leisure Class by Thorsten Veblen. And I'll tell you, this idea with status, this is nothing new, folks. This goes all the way back to before we walked over here from Africa, when when the, the hunting parties would go out, Time. and the chief, the, the head hunter, would get the... Uh, Kill the animal. He would be the one that would get the teeth or the horns as a trophy, and that was his status in the tribe. And ever since then, it's been Mercedes Benz or it's been the fancy watches or or whatever his status. Okay. It might get laid off at Benefit Society, right? I realize that I'm probably wearing out this job. But after listening to our good friend Mr. Manner speak, yet I am again persuaded that he would have been happier in the era in which either Benjamin Harrison or William McKinley was the president of the United States. Um, he, he spoke earlier. Um, where did this idea of companies giving back to the uh, society come from? And we mentioned Andrew Carnegie, excuse me, Andrew Carnegie. Well, it also went back to, not only to Andrew Mellon, who gave us the National Gallery, but it also went back to people like even greedy old John D. Rockefeller Sr., who also gave money to establish things like the University of Chicago. What's wrong with the idea of companies expressing some gratitude for all the money that they extort from us, and as a result, giving some of it back. And as for the comment, you know, that Walmart is, that all us lower, lower L, lower case liberals are busy decrying Walmart, well, yeah, we are with good reason. It's become a monopoly. And there's some of us out here who think that antitrust action should be taken against Walmart and break it up into two or three smaller sized competing companies. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I think our speaker needs to redefine redefinition. We read the blurb for this talk on the curriculum and all these businesses that are going to redefine them, or have been redefining themselves the past 20 years or so, is it anything about getting the government out of it? Because most of these businesses, especially the big ones, get some kind of subtle aid from the government. There's a quote from Marx somewhere, I couldn't tell you where, but I heard this years ago, the government is the executive committee of the ruling class. So you think, you know, when I say I'm against government, you think I'm in favor of big business. Well, no, that's, that's quite, you've got to quite pass backwards. But anyway, what we heard was basically different marketing strategies designed to cope with the changing times in a chaotic manner. And uh, I didn't really get a whole lot out of it. Oh. But I think what really needs redefinition is the union, especially the way it is marketed here. You hear things like happiness is a warm baseball bat. 
beaten up a scab. Yeah. Or uh, I know when I go on these negotiations, I, I know I'm unwanted. It's, it's kind of, uh, it kind of seems ironic to me. You know, you think I'm in a union, but I actually I might go down in the history as the one who saved the union from the union heads. For yourself. But, uh, you know, uh, I think it's going to be something a little more fundamental than what we've heard tonight. The whole idea of union head is excluding skips. Well, there's been some, I was at this Clarence Darrell function a couple, two, three years ago. <coughs> they were, the guy was distinguishing between inclusive and exclusive unions. And I have to wonder how inclusive can a union be and still be a union? But, uh, you gotta realize, I mean, you realize yourselves, you blame it on somebody else. You do realize that the unions are in trouble, and that union membership as a percentage of the workforce has been going down in recent decades. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a real simple economic explanation for that. It's that high prices limit your market. Yeah, greedy unions. But anyway, uh, and then when you when you have to lower your prices, you call it a give back. If you know any market theory, though, and not just as some kind of boogeyman who I hear it uh, mentioned around here, that the market is an equilibrium seeking process. Equilibrium seeking process. You seek to establish some type of some type of uh, relationship between costs and benefits. I don't hear anything like that tonight either. It just is all this kind of chaos of all these changing sales and everything the past 20 decades, which is true as far as it goes, but it doesn't really, it didn't really tell me anything I didn't know. And it doesn't really give us a handle on insight or anything. But I think when you're really going to run into a marketing problem, this whole idea of union sol worker solidarity. Because yeah. what are you doing to other workers? Scabs are workers, and what do you do to them? Beat them up. Yeah, that's it. And you call that union solidarity. Drive your car over. <laughs> yeah, well, and you guys get a pretty good laugh out of that, too, don't you? Yep. You betcha. But anyway, and you keep saying that. Huh? And I hear somebody saying that I'm going to go over the union side. Well, certainly not when you're marketing the thing that way. Thanks, Bill. All right. Yeah, I just uh, want to thank uh, <coughs> Peter for uh, this interesting talk. Uh, happy that it made it uh, dialogue so we could talk back and forth during the presentation. Uh, the other thing is, is I got to be careful how I say your last name. Because I, it's very easy for me to mix you up with Peter Nero. Uh, <laughs> if any of you remember the pianist. Anyway, uh, the other thing is, uh, when Frank was up here, I didn't hear everything he said, but it sounded like uh, to me that he was looking forward to my May 12th talk on super string theory being a theoretical concept of God. Is that right? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, guy out there. Well, at any rate, uh, that's going to be me uh, on your schedule. Uh, some of the things uh, regarding this talk, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, uh, Peter talked about uh, credit cards, and uh, you know what was popular last Christmas for people was the layaway. But uh, in my personal life, uh, at a very young age, I was exposed to a different kind of economy. 
and that uh, was something that my father worked out with local merchants, and that was uh, pay when you can get it. Uh, he had a grocer, I remember he always used to go to his grocer on Friday nights after putting on work. He sold magazines by the way, so his income was very irregular. We'd be up one week and down the next. and. Uh, so he worked out a deal with the grocer that uh, he would go and buy a box of groceries for the family and then the grocer, uh, this was probably before credit cards came into being, would pick up a file box from under the counter and he would find my father's name on it and run up the grocery bill and he had an account and you know he would add the current purchase to the previous purchase and you know that's what the grocer was owed by my father. And then when he, he had some extra money, uh, he would go to the grocer and pay down the debt. You know, it was very convenient, no interest charges or anything, very simple system. Uh, and strangely enough, there was a gas station guy at the corner of uh, Oakley and Ashland that ran his uh, station the same way. Uh, I think his name was Bill or whatever. My father used to go there, pull it in the car, and uh, the guy just sat there and uh, the people filled up their tanks, it was sort of an early version of self-service. And they went and told uh, Bob, you know, how much uh, they uh, filled their cars up with and he would put it on their account and then like they, my father did with Grocer, when he had the money he'd go over there and pay the guy and that's the way they did business in those days. This is like in the early 60s. So I doubt if anybody really does business like that, but, you know, in these tough times, you never know. Uh, the other thing I, I want to say is that, uh, you know, uh, whenever you buy something these days, you look at where the item is made, especially clothing. You know, it says China, India, uh, Taiwan, and um, so, you know, it's everywhere but the U.S. And uh, there's not a lot of opportunity, but it, it seems like the U.S. has a lot of buying power. And right now, our unemployment rate is running at 9%. Now, when I was a kid, a, a teenager, I used to work at a pencil factory that was located on Foster and uh, Ravenswood there. It was called Auto Point. And it was a U.S.-based business, but uh, today you couldn't find uh, that product anywhere, you know. Pentel was just coming on in like 69 and it's a mainstay ever since in the writing instrument business. When you were a kid, how, how old were you? Huh? When you were a kid, how old were you? I was, it was in my late teens, you know, oh. 19, 20. So at any rate, uh, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, uh, so you know, you don't, we don't have a lot of that basic uh, manufacturing business in this country. And I'm afraid that this 9% unemployment rate is going to be kind of considered what in 64, we, at 4% we used to say that was full employment or unemployment. And I think that 9% number is going to be around with us for a while. And, uh, you know, I worry about, you know, with the population growing and more babies being born every year, exactly, you know, time, what we're going to be doing. Thank you. My first question to Peter and to all you crowd is, where have you guys been for the last 20 years? Isn't, isn't there something called the internet that came in? What about Facebook and Twitter? What about the development of social networking and marketing of products? What about Amazon.com, eBay, and Overstock, and my former employer, e, uh, Ubit? Do you realize what revolutions have gone on in retailing in the last 20 years alone? The development of online banking through PayPal, uh, some of the way these banks work. I mean, it takes a lot more people to run a basic bank today than it did 20 years ago with just a bank of tellers. There's server farms, there's people on the phone, there's online banking records, there's fraud protection, not to mention the amount of data that's accumulated now with the development of credit cards. 
Now, Brandon, we all missed a local merchant yeah. who could bring you up on account and uh, give you your business. But, you know, there's ways that we've coped with it. It's now called the credit card. It's now called something else. And a lot of the merchants would rather not extend credit, cash and carry, or credit and carry. It's a lot easier to do business. And today, my, you know, it, it just behooves me that, you know, you, you just don't put. You, you talk about the demise of local business. You talk about the demise of the road to the marketplace. But where do you spend your money? You, a lot of times, the reason these big box retailers are here is because that's exactly what the consumer wants. There is a lot of research that goes into marketing these days and into where things go. And believe me, if they see a trend on a new product or a new service, they're hot on it. And if you don't believe me, look at the consumer electronics industry, look at the development of smartphones, look at the development of these dollar stores. A lot of these companies know that people are having trouble in these high-end department stores. The incomes is not as high as it used to be. So the dollar stores and the flea markets and everything else are coming back in and into vogue. And a lot of these, even even in the fashion industry, you're starting to see uh, economic, these the high-end designers starting to finally bring it down. Now, I understand that maybe I may not be the biggest guy to talk about the fashion industry, but, you know, when you look at things like from my videography standpoint, the cost of weddings alone and some of these other things, there's a real bit of trend for discount, a real trend for bringing things down, down in price. And it's a lot easier today for somebody to get into the industry than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Even in the music industry where we have iTunes or direct distribution of DVDs on, from, the, from band sales, they no longer have to have the middleman to do it. The cost of equipment's gotten a lot lower. I will simply say this, Peter. I liked your presentation, but it was lacking in a lot of the more recent trends. You know, I mentioned to you in a long tail, but what you needed to really get into was targeted marketing, social networking. I mean, today, Caitlin, you're on Facebook all the time, correct? And Twitter. And Twitter. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you buy something based off the recommendation of one of your friends yeah. on Twitter or Facebook? Never. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, if, if it was a good product or a hot trend. Yeah. I mean, you would look there first before you looked at the company website, wouldn't you? Yep. See, that's what we're talking about. And with, with people of her generation and her age, this is what's going to happen with marketing. The local networked consumer is coming back into vogue. It's just they're now connected with Facebook, they're connected with Twitter, and if you don't believe me, look at Tiger Direct, otherwise known as CompUSA. They have an extensive Facebook page where you can friend them, where they have a, they have a place where you can follow them in their Twitter feeds. Most of your major department stores are the same way. And if you don't believe me in the way this marketing trend is going, look at a place called ABT Electronics up in North Brook. They have a very high-end store. You can go in there, you can still barter your way with electronics and, and almost on TVs and anything else. And if, and if you still don't believe me, go down to Fry's, located down in North Brook, or Oak Brook. They have a ton of selection of stuff. And if, you, and if they can't find it, hell, there's always the internet. I can tell you from personal experience that eBay basically saved the place I worked at. We went from a wholesale trucking operation to retailers because the market dried up. We started taking your goods and putting it on eBay, and we're prospering. If you're looking for a cordless phone or you're looking for a uh, piece of televisions or things like this, see Paul for your computers and talk to me about your next television. So we probably can save you some money through manufacturing refurbished products. Branding is very important, there's no question about that. But we've got to look further ahead than just the revolutions of the last 10 or 20 years. We've got to look 2,000 years ahead for this reason. When ancient Chicago is under study by archaeologists and they go digging around they're going to find a lot of these golden arches. <laughs> and they're going to see these golden arches and they're going to figure, aha, this was a major religion amongst the ancient <laughs> And they would, and yes, yes, plastic was an important part of the, you know, religion. And they would look around and find all of these temples 
to McDonald's. <laughs> and their chief god, Ronald McDonald. Oh, <laughs> and his younger brother, Archie McDonald. <laughs> and they're going to find that, yes, this was a major religion, but they were under heavy competition from another competing cult, Burger King. Right. Burger King's chief doctrine was they were apparently a very non judgmental cult. Their directive was have it your way. And true devotees of Burger King on special feast days walked around with cardboard golden crowns. And they would go into the Burger King periodically. And they would be served by priests and priestesses wearing the golden <laughs> crowns. And the archaeologists would say, ah, this was important. But the most interesting of the mystery religions of ancient America was probably Wendy's. Now, they had, by reputation, the juiciest hamburgers. And the, the scientists of 2,000 years from now wondered why. And then they read the slogan emblazoned in every temple to Wendy's all over. Be Wendy's kind of people. <laughs> and they concluded, aha, this was a consensual cannibal cult. <laughs> now, people knew, the archaeologists are going to conclude, people knew what to expect in each of these places and uh, chose accordingly where they were going to worship. Same thing is true today. Uh, Charles suggested that we only need one kind of sedan, that we only need one kind of uh, uh, clothing, uh, that we can, you know, kind of uh, do away with brands, do away with those differences, and we'll all be happier, uh, and things will be cheaper. I mean, the fact of the matter is, looking around this room, we have a wide variety of tastes, or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, some of us prefer L.L. Bean, or prefer Land's End, and when we go looking for suits, we prefer uh, you know, maybe um, Brooks Brothers. Others wouldn't be caught dead in any of those places. Uh, the brands are designed to appeal to people who know what to expect of each of those brands. We're in a political season, the silly season. Okay, we've got two major brands in this country, like it or not. We've got the various strains of Republicans, and we've got the various stripes of Democrats. People coalesce around either party because they know what to expect. And one of the reasons it has been so difficult for third, fourth, or fifth parties to take root in this country has been because of the fact that people like the tried, the true, the familiar. The same is true with products. And, you know, say, say what you will, about new marketing techniques, this doesn't at all change the, the fact that, look folks, we all know what we like, we go where we like to eat, we go where we like to shop, we drive what we like. You know, what, would, what kind of a country would this be if we had one car in one color? Even in the Soviet Union, you had several different kinds of cars in, believe it or not, several different kinds of colors. Now, never mind that you'd have to Time. wait 10 years to get that car delivered. Time. The fact of the matter is, you would get it in Time. your brand, and you would get it in your color, or maybe your grandchildren would get it. We're very brand conscious in this country, probably in all countries, as human beings. Look at China. Time. Ch uh, it's time? Okay. <laughs> Yes, we moved to China.
China is marketing and marketing. Uh, oh, Two thousand years ago, Jesus was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good marketer. Our children, uh, Jesus he, uh, I oh, you. What nails they used to nail? One pe people would come from all over to hear him because he did healings. Oh, and, uh, aside from that. He uh, cast out demons. You know, he knew how Whoa. to speak to people. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he told yeah. a big story. <laughs> yeah, without a story, uh, he didn't speak to them because he knew that he had to capture their imagination. And he did that. Well, we yeah. still tell his parables. Uh, he, he promoted charity. And uh, he did a temple cleansing. Yes. Uh, he uh, uh, spoke truth to power. He uh, could call Herod that fox. Uh, he was not subservient to the Pharisees. Uh, he called them uh, whited sepulchers. Of course, they didn't like that very much either. Uh, but he was raising the dead, and uh, well, you believe that, right? Yes, I do, and I know <laughs> why. And yeah. I can see uh, parallels in uh, what people can do today, and I hope today, huh? that uh, something <laughs> of what we do is raising the dead. Uh, amongst uh, people at the College of Conflict. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for Even resurrection. Dead, I'm dead. looking for oh, eternal oh, life, just as some pious <laughs> Jews were doing 2,000 years ago. They asked him questions, and he told them what eternal life really was. Shit. Uh, and... <laughs> He, and following him, you, you too, can find him. Uh, Look in your heart. Well, <laughs> a good marketer. Uh, he also organized his disciples, uh, sending them out to uh, groups of 70, uh, two by two, uh, sell, uh, Jesus, to uh, preach to others and to help them to raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, yeah. to cast out demons, yeah. and do healing. Yeah. Right. Amen. Healing. Right. Yeah. I too would like to thank our speaker. I I thought it was a very interesting yeah. subject and handled quite well. It's nice to hear someone saying what I've been saying for years. I have never, ever purchased a t-shirt with someone's branding on it. I own a few because they were given to me for free. Personally, I feel if someone wants me to wear their advertising, they should be paying me. I shouldn't be paying them. Why are you wearing a cross then? That's not advertising. Oh no, what is it? You, you As far as it's a reminder. You said reminder? It's been mentioned about it's been mentioned about um, automation removing people from jobs. I read the book by Bill Gates, The Road Ahead, which was written in nineteen ninety five. And it was looking ahead at automation of the internet and what it's gonna to do to society. Back then, the thought was the people who lost their jobs to automation would be retrained into higher positions, the service positions. But to a great extent, that hasn't happened. 
As many of you know, I run a computer company. I build computers and such. I can't afford to buy my own service, my own computers. Any computer I have was built out of junk I got from somebody else. Pieced together from computers that people traded in with me so they could buy my computers. You mentioned about the grocery stores, how there's so few choices. And I think what happened there, <clears throat> I grew up in Cicero, near my suburb here. Carrying a gun? Huh? Carrying a gun? No habla. <laughs> um, I don't live there anymore. <laughs> I've been, my brothers and I have been trying to get my dad out of there for years. But in our neighborhood, we always had everywhere around little family grocery stores. Little, these little markets. Then a big jewel store moved in, undercut all their prices, put all these little places out of business, and actually the jewel store is gone. It's a CVS yeah. now. Because the store they had, they said, was too small. So they went somewhere else and built a bigger one. So now there are no choices there because they've all been put out of business. I'm a big internet person too, along with Tim, and I agree with you strongly about, you know, you bought Facebook, you start participating in one of their apps, but there's no way of contacting these people, and what makes it even worse is they want you to send them money to support them making things that don't work, and you have no way of contacting them to have your say and tell them this isn't working, that isn't working, or whatever. And I. I never send any of them any money. I don't have money to give to anybody right now, but I wouldn't send any of them money if I can't contact them. Thank you. Well, uh, first little story about individual marketing. A fellow I knew told a story about a girlfriend of his, how important it is at the retail level to, be, to know your market. Uh, his girlfriend was a sales clerk in cosmetics at Neiman Marcus, and a very wealthy lady came in and was looking at the cosmetics, and she said, well, I really don't need any of this stuff. And his friend, the sales clerk, said, ma'am, this is Neiman Marcus. Nobody really needs anything in this entire store. That's not why you're here. Half an hour later, she left with about $900 worth of bombs and potions and everything else. So uh, there's does big down to the individual bit. Uh, I agree with Brown that some of the greatest marketing uh, in history is not really a product so much as ideas, uh, and the church is one of them, and various political systems are another. I mean, sometimes good marketers can even sell very bad ideas. Look at, for example, the fact that the Republicans actually still get some votes. Uh, now, uh, one thing that I disagree with our speaker on is uh, the business of, of international marketing, the world market, the fact that we have a global economy. Personally, I think in the long run this is better for a lot of people. I know I get some disagreement from that in this room. But it's here we need to learn how to deal with it, and, and many companies and people have, and others are struggling with it. The problem with globalization is that the benefits are spread evenly across the population, but the problems, such as plants closing and businesses moving overseas and so forth, are very focused on a few people. A few people get hurt fairly badly, at least in the short run. Words we all benefit a little, and, and we need to learn to deal with this. Uh, in fact, I've talked about that from this podium a few years ago. Uh, the economic problems that we have, people want to blame on offshoring and, and other countries and people in other countries uh, who want to share in the bounty that the world has. They see what the life we have, they want some of it, uh, and, and they're probably entitled to it. We're not the only ones that are entitled to a good life. Uh, the problems we have, I think, are based on a few greedy bastards in this country that run a lot of our organizations uh, and their political puppets. And of course, they're at it again, as they are uh, every four years. Uh, to conclude, oh, I wanted to, uh, Pat Butler brought up the Burger King slogan, reminded me of a quip by Johnny Carson a few years ago. 
He said, if you're driving down Santa Monica Boulevard and you see a sign in the window that says, have it your way, it might not be a hamburger parlor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Good seeing our speaker. All right, and I want to thank you all. I I had a very fatiguing week at a conference in Pittsburgh. Compliments to the to the people of the United States. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm be eclectic as usual uh, regarding uh, the philanthropist. You should eliminate those conditions that create philanthropists. Now you're talking. No, there should not be one individual in such, there's something wrong with your economic system if you're producing inter yeah, whatever, if you're producing these super wealthy individuals. It's a symptom of, a, of, a, of an economy that's malfunctioning from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, that one individual would accrue a disproportionate amount of wealth to distribute it. Somehow, it's presumed like that's a normal function of government, if anything, the redistribution of wealth, how that wealth should be distributed. You're saying one Jamal gets to do it, to decide, you know. I, I, I don't know. I, since when? That's crazy. Uh, regarding the internet, your marketing, sir, has destroyed a wonderful tool for communications and the edification of mankind and sharing of human knowledge. You've turned it into nothing but a stupid yellow pages. You've destroyed it. You've ruined it. It's next to worthless. And that's because you and don't search long enough. because some guy wants to make money and they've taken it over and ruined it. It's worthless. It might as well be discarded and start all over a few years. I don't even think it can be corrected. It's that far gone. And whether or not buying <laughs> stuff on this, that's, that's nonsense. That's the use of what this wonderful device. That's, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's, that's the antithesis. The dissemination of human knowledge and communication it wasn't intended to make some guy rich. Are you kidding? It's crazy. Um, and I contend you're yes. ignorant of its use. Yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, oh it's just so I can't comprehend what it is. Uh, the big, um, really, I, I'm not into retailing and the secretion of material goods. I've, I've not really been in a big box store, I must confess, in a long time. Maybe once a few years ago. Even though I work downtown, I, I've, I've rarely been in any sort of department store. I honestly don't feel that there's no function. I don't really... I, the last time I was in a big box store, I said, if, I, if, if somebody gave me the entire store, I'd kind of like give it away. <laughs> to get rid of it. <laughs> you want it? You can have it. I don't know. Uh, Groceries. Oh, the other thing that's that's really distraught about this this whole retailing thing, having been in another city, I I still remember my sister talking about moving to the southwest, and I I, I said, you know, we have this homogenization of our society here, that it's all the same. You know, I was in Pittsburgh. I might as well have been any place, and she was moving to the southwest, and I said, you're just trading a hotter, silly suburb. For a colder one, they're all the same. You know, the same store, Best Buys, what have you. Like, you know, so what's the difference? What's the real difference here? There's, there's no culture. It's, it's just void of culture, if anything. Uh, the only retailing I really kind of need is maybe grocery stores, but that's largely, to me, a matter of proximity to where I live and. I, I just don't understand why you need all of this. I mean, can't we focus on a few basic essentials that people need for survival and focus on clothes? I don't know why we don't nationalize the shoe industry. I'd be perfectly happy to wear prison shoes or something. You know, it's, they're perfectly fine and adequate. I mean, certainly meet my need. 
How about the only retailing I deal with? I get shirts laundered, but that, that's about it. Now, the last thing I did, I, getting back to my dear reverend here, I did see this morning some retailing of Jesus. And this minister, maybe you could tell me, he claimed there I'm were 1,128 chapters of the Bible. Anyhow, he figured out if you sent him $1,128, you would get a blessing. <laughs> Anyhow, I got to go because I'm not blessed with any more time. <laughs> but I'm going to send this guy my money. Anyhow, he said you'd get some return on this stuff. Anyhow, thank you. I don't have any... Oh, one other thing. You, you missed, and I well, I don't care what time. Uh, the worst thing about this whole thing is, the, in terms of the conditions of employment, are the people that are consigned to working in these retail establishments. To my mind, they're, they're, they're no better off than the people in coal mines. This is really nothing but pure exploitation on a massive scale all across the United States. The things they do to people in retail businesses is just, they should be arrested to, for what's going on out there. You have no idea the number of unpaid hours they work, things like this or anything like that. It's always been the worst case whatsoever, except for Sears. Sears wasn't bad. Sears treated their employees like human beings the profit sharing, but the rest of these are just ruthless thugs. Thank you. Oh, I see the new um, book being sent marketing oh. in the U.S. There's nothing but sheer corporate greed, and that's the only factor that's considered. That's the only one they care about. No. Is uh, making money and efficiency. They could care less about people, like Charlie just said, especially the employees. But also the consumers. It's um, total materialism winning over us in the U.S. and the no, world. Um, we're, we're left with uh, nothing but more products and more availability to them. Um, but we do need human voices. We do need to overcome our fear of intimacy and to have less intimacy, not a lot more. The street side streets in the city are empty everywhere, every neighborhood seems to me. There's some people on the main street shopping, which is good. You know, they go to my, um, they go to the few mom and pop stores still left, or as, as well as the big box stores. But um, at least uh, you know, mom and pop might yell at you. But uh, at least you knew who they were. In the big boxes, there's someone new every day. So we've been dehumanized um, by these new marketing trends totally. And uh, like I said, um, we become things and objects to be manipulated and exploited and not respected whatsoever. The only thing that matters is the big buck. Okay. And um, that's the way I see it. We've, we've lost the intimacy of a mom and pop. We've lost a lot of the human spirit. And with that, we lose a lot. Time's up, so Peter, sum it up. OK, Peter, let's get you summing up here. Well, I'll say much. Uh, I think you've all said it all to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I never got the answer about the internet and who can we call. Apparently no one has a toll-free number for Google. Um, Yahoo? Uh, I, I was hoping I could get corrected and someone would say, I've used it, I've called many times. You're just not digging deeply, Pharaoh. You should try we, being a vendor with Amazon. <laughs> no. what, what? I may have an answer for it if you want. You have it? There is no number. I may have an answer because I had a oh. problem with Hotmail. We do have an email address you can go to. You have to jump through some hoops, but you can get things adjusted well, going through email. He's got an email address, heaven help him. I mean, some of us still need a voice saying, click on this, click on that. Can't get it. Can't get it. It's up to Tim and his associates to create, I suppose, a business off the loss. Our need. Most of your legitimate retailers always have a number you can call. They always have an accredited I, BBB online seal of approval. I proved it with the, uh, with the uh, peanut butter and the cosmetics, but shouldn't the person that sold us the net 
service, although we don't pay for it, I suppose. We suffer the ads, but shouldn't they be providing a, a voice somewhere? The, the labor surely here uh, of unemployed who would stay on the phone at home and service our question. But I didn't get the answer to that one. Uh, anyway, I thought there was a lot of humor expressed in the end here in the row, and I'm glad of that because we do need some humor to survive these troubled times. We do rely on some humor for that. Thank you. Uh, some of the comments about Burger King. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to present were net gains, net losses in, in this new system of marketing, capitalism, buying and selling. And I still conclude that we're at a net loss given the changing face of capitalism today. And I hope there's some, some sort of restructuring or reform uh, some sort of managed market, if not a socialist solution, I will say. But um, I, don't, I don't see anyone in the next election who's offering real alternatives to what we're left with. So we've got to do it ourselves. Uh, keep calling Bank of America or First National and uh, see if we can uh, beat them at their own game. Thanks for listening. Thank you all for coming. Thank the schedule we hope to see you soon again. Service phone number and support. So, Tim, you guys have a, a DVD player you can bring here?